Hi, I'm Tobias Carlyle. This is the Acquirers Podcast. My special guest today is Justin Carbono of Validia and Validia Capital Management. Validia uh, replicate guru strategies and track some other strategies. And they have a money management firm, an ETF. Uh, we're going to talk to Justin right after this. Go. Tobias Carlyle is the founder and principal of Acquires Funds. For regulatory reasons, he will not discuss any of the Acquires Funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Acquires Funds or affiliates. For more information, visit acquiresfunds.com. Hi, Justin. Hey, Toby. How are you? I'm really well. We we met face to face for the first time. We've known each other for a, a, a little over a year, but we met face to face for the first time in Hollywood, Florida, at the Inside ETFs conference. Where yeah. it turns out you're the fastest man in ETFs. The fastest man that uh, no one knows about, apparently. Um, yeah, that was actually kind of a funny story. And um, you know, they do this fun run down there. It was Tuesday morning. It was like six thirty. Um, there was like a hundred people there, which was cool. They organized it. And, um, I mean, anytime there's a run, I ran in college. So anytime there's a, like a, a run like that, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to put my, you know, put, put my, uh, put my feet on the ground and, and try to work hard anyway. So the run starts and actually they have like a celebrity runner there. It's like, I don't know his name's Meb. He actually, I think he won the Boston marathon maybe in 2016. And I think he was like a not silver Meb medalist. Faber. Not Meb, yeah, Meb Faber. Not, no, not Meb Faber. <laughs> Um, so yeah, they had this celebrity runner, you know, this group of people starts and, you know, I went out kind of hard, but I wasn't running like race pace anyways at like the two mile mark. I'm like out in the lead and I'm with the police escort. It's just like me and the police escort and we get back to the Delmont, which is the hotel and like no one's there. It's like the race just like ends and I'm like looking around saying like, usually there's somebody at the finish line, you know, to like greet you or say, this is the finish line. So I go up to get my stuff, like the bag and my water bottle or whatever. And then I walk back down and I see like people finishing. And then Ben Johnson from Morningstar is kind of like finishing and walks by me. He's like, man, did you see that Meb guy? He was flying. I don't think anybody caught him. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, geez, like no one even knows that I finished first and it doesn't even matter because it wasn't a race but it was just it was kind of hilarious um and then i texted you and i actually like texted my wife you know when the race was done i'm like you know the race is done and she's like how'd you do and i'm like yeah i i, I kind of finished first and she's like like congratulations or you know whatever and i'm like well thanks but no one really even knows <laughs> you were so too anyway, far out. you were too funny. far out in front but it shouldn't be any surprise you're a division one collegiate athlete at the university of connecticut what, what did you run there so I ran middle distance. I ran the uh, 400 and 800 uh, outdoor and then the 1,000 indoor, basically. That doesn't really uh, translate that well to a 5K. No, but middle distance is once you have – middle distance runners, you know, you have to have quite a bit of endurance. So – and I, I mean, I still run. I still run quite, you know, like, uh, you know, maybe a couple times a week um, get out there. I did some hill work last night, so that was painful. Maybe you should get in contact with Nike. Tell him you're going to go and run a marathon. So yeah, you nice. got, you, you're going to get mad. <clears throat> so uh, you you were you're at business school at you did your MBA at the University of Connecticut, and yep. it turns out you're in the business school hall of fame. What, so how does that happen? Yeah, so at UConn in the MBA in the full time MBA program, um, which I was very fortunate to attend, I had a, actually a graduate assistantship. So I my tuition was waived, and I did like work with the marketing department um, while at UConn and. You know, this was like 2002 to 04, so the internet was just, it was there, but it was, schools were trying to figure out how to more, better utilize the web with their own marketing and positioning. So um, I worked with the marketing department on building out some of that as part of my graduate assistantship. And then, you know, I think it was a combination of students and faculty that voted for the one business school student that sort of exemplified the characteristics that, you know, they wanted to see. And I was the one that was 
selected. So it was pretty. That's pretty incredible. Cool. Yeah. So now, now you're uh, you're a managing partner at Validia, and you have yep. you have two. Um, there are two parts to the business. One is a website that tracks uh, gurus and also um, sort of not not factors, but different different investment strategies. And then you have a money management firm. Let's just talk about the website first. Okay. So what what uh, what what does the website do, and uh, what's the what's the focus? Okay. So the the core of the website is basically running a series of strategies or models based on um, legendary investors. So people like Warren Buffett, Peter Lynch, Benjamin Graham. Um, and in addition to that, we've actually rolled out a second set of strategies based on acad- ac- academic papers and books. And so what we basically do is <clears throat> now in some cases, the strategies are very clear. It's very clear what the actual underlying investment criteria and the factors are. In other cases, there had to be some level of interpretation that goes into it. Like with, with Buffett, for example, Buffett's never really disclosed his exact stock picking strategy. And he probably doesn't have an exact stock picking strategy. So we base our Buffett model off the book Buffettology. Um, and we can maybe go into that in a little bit. <clears throat> but basically what we do is we computerize these investment strategies. And then on Validia, you can do, a, it's, it's kind of like that's, that's the underlying sort of core foundation is these computerized models. And then it's like building things on top of those. So imagine for a minute you have a strategy, let's say the Peter Lynch model, and that there's certain fundamental criteria that goes into that. On Validia, you can type in a ticker symbol and you can see step by step how how the Lynch method looks at, you know, over 6,000 securities. And we do that for 22 different models. So there's a lot of what I would call like, you know, sort of like fundamental analysis, but it's not just lists and stuff and screens and portfolios. It's actually the ability to like look inside or look under the hood of a stock and see why a stock passes or fails a particular model. Um, that's something we call like our guru analysis, or that's an analysis engine. If you want to see how your stock stacks up, the other side of what I would say we do is running like model portfolios and screens. So sticking with the Lynch method for a minute, you know, if you want to see the top names, according to our interpretation of the Peter Lynch strategy, um, we run model portfolios based on that. And then we also run stock screens. There's a difference between those two things. A model portfolio, we're sort of tracking the performance. We're limiting the portfolio to 10 or 20 securities. We follow different rebalancing frequencies. Um, And um, I'll kind of come back to the portfolios maybe in a minute if we talk about it. But And then the screens are just really an idea generation list. It's like, show me the top stocks today according to the Lynch model. And then you can combine that with other fundamental factors if you want to kind of narrow the list down further. And that's a subscription-based product. People subscribe to that. Let's let's dig into the uh, the different gurus and their strategies. Start, let's start mm-hmm. with Warren Buffett because there's a lot of okay. uh, there are lots of uh, so magic formula is a is a quantitative expression mm-hmm. of Buffett's strategy. And the magic formula is return on invested capital on the one hand, and then uh, enterprise value on operating income or EBIT operating income. So how, how do you guys uh, classify Buffett? So, yeah. So our Buffett model is um, it's based on the book Buffett Buffettology. And, you know, there's probably been like hundreds of books written about Buffett's approach, but that's the one that we sort of honed in on as having the clearest um, set of criteria that we could extract and be computerized. So the first step is it starts with looking at trying to determine if earnings are predictable. And so what our Buffett model does is it looks at 10 years worth of earnings and it says, are earnings in this company predictable? Because, you know, in the book, and I think we know this to be true, that Buffett wa- doesn't like vol- volatile earnings. I mean, the more predictable the earnings are sort of in his mind, I think the better. Um, and that allows in our model that actually comes back full circle when we go to estimate the ex- expected return, which I'll get to. But the, the first criteria is our earnings predictable. The next criteria is um, and so we look at 10 years of earnings. The next criteria is, is does the company have um, a higher than average long term return on capital and return on total capital? And so our strategy looks at 10 years of ROE and ROTC to, to and that's sort of trying to express if a company has a competitive advantage or a moat around their profitability. 
So when you look at 10 years, like in the last 10 years, you know, most companies, well, maybe I shouldn't say most, many companies have, you know, a sort of st steady ROE or return on, return on capital. But, you know, when you get these cycles in the, in the business cycle, most 10 year periods, you know, you get to see where the weak, where the weaknesses are in companies because the, 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 the profitability dips. And so our model doesn't like to see that our model rewards companies that are maintaining that higher degree of profitability over long periods of time. Um, and then there's a whole nother set of factors. Like does the company have the ability to pay off its debt, uh, given the earnings it's generating is management using, um, are they generating a solid return on the retained earnings that they're retaining as a company? Is the company buying back stock? So these are all factors that are incorporated in the model and companies are basically, they basically pass or fail each particular criteria and only the ones that get passes are the ones that actually score the best according to the Buffett model. Um, and then the, on the on the the uh, sort of in conclusion, there's like a part of the strategy that tries to estimate the expected return for the stock, and it does that using two different methods: the ROE and the EPS method. Um, and it our model basically likes to see stocks that have an expected return of at least 15% a year looking out. Um, and so so yeah, that's that's the Buffett strategy. I mean, it's obviously much more. Uh, granular and, and maybe detailed than something like the Greenblatt model, which he's trying to get at some of that. But so was, that's, that's where I was going to go next. So you, you track the Greenblatt model as well. Do you know how mm -hmm. the two have compared? Well, yes, gr the Greenblatt strategy has been very volatile. Right, it's, very volatile. It, yeah, very volatile. It's we. It tends to bring us into this what we would kind of mostly call like the small cap value area. Um, and the Buffett strategy tends to select large, given those criteria tends to select larger, more quality type companies that tend to exhibit less volatility. Um, one of the interesting things just to note, we also run this system on Canadian equities and South African stocks. So and we do those with partners in different in, in those countries. But the Buffett strategy, actually, interestingly enough, in those separate markets, actually is one, is is in like the top performing group, top performing like twenty five percent of strategies that we run. So so it is interesting, and it's that's not true of the U.S. strategies, but um, in 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 those other markets, it it tends to be a really good performer. I, I wonder if that's uh, it's something that I. Because I watch the Australian market reasonably mm. closely, and a lot of the uh, other stock markets around the world, excluding the US, haven't crested their 2007 peak. They're still trading, mm. so they all got very cheap. And then that's kind of what you know. If you're a value guy, that's what you want to see. It increases the size of your universe, and you should do fairly well. The US uh, got back over it in about 2012 or something. I like, got over its 2007 peak in 2012, and has powered on from there. I saw a chart yesterday. I know that, you know, and we've talked about this, this underperformance of value, but this is kind of amazing. It was talking about, it was someone, it was some, it was either, what was it, Deutsche Bank or one of like the big European banks or managers. They're basically saying, you know, value is finally set to turn. That was, and we've been, you know, this has been a couple of years now. We've been hearing this and waiting for it, right? Five but, years. <laughs> right, exactly. But what it showed, and this kind of blew my mind that, um, and I may have even, tweeted it i'm not sure but the msci value index over the past 10 years has a negative return no kidding yeah i mean i mean think about that for a second 10 years of you know in international markets developed international markets of like negative performance um and you know and uh and then and then it was comparing the chart was comparing like the msci growth index which was up like 60 or 70 percent so that wasn't that great either right um but i i just thought it was like i was like holy smokes this is crazy it's a it's a phenomenon that i have seen i i um i look at the msci occasionally too just to see how it's doing and i think it's, it's only recently so every i think it was msci developed market which is about 22 of the biggest developed markets around mm -hmm. the world, has only just recently got over its 2007 peak. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, uh, it's, and it's still not, it's not particularly cheap where it is. And that's true of right. some, some of these other countries as well. And I think, 
you know, Australia and Canada in particular, I don't know the South African market as well, but I imagine it's pretty similar. They're, Australia and Canada are dominated by big financial institutions and yep. basic materials, which is yeah. mining, as you'd expect. And so they're yep. very cyclical. They yeah, really for sure. get beaten up. That's true. Yep. So, um, Sorry, we got off the guru strategies there for a sec, but... No, we, we can go wherever we want. We don't have to... There's, there's no set agenda. So, you, you, tr- you, in that... In that how, many, how many guru strategies do you track? So, we have 22 now. And uh, what, what are the best performers? What, what's done the best over the last, say, decade? Well, it's the growth and momentum stuff uh, for the most part. So, um, I mean, one of the extremely... And, you know, we would have never been able to predict this. And it's not to say that the next 10 years are going to be like the last 10, but... One of the strategies that has really stood out is um, it's it's called the small cap growth investor strategy. And we base it off a model that was outlined by the Motley Fool. Right. Um, and this is, yeah, it, we based it off the Motley Fool investor guide. It's basically like a, it's, it is what it is. It's a small cap growth st- uh, investor strategy. And it has like a very strong momentum criteria. So stocks that only are, that have a relative strength of 90% or better are the ones that score highest in the model, along with these gr- other growth statistics that it looks at. Um, so that surprisingly, it's been a vi- it's been a great performer. It's been and this is model portfolio performance. This isn't actual money management performance. These are model portfolios that are run and tracked on the site. So I want to be careful, you know, not to say that th- this is actual money management performance. But um, but yeah, so that's been a really impressive one. And then. We recently rolled out a whole new set of, so of the 22, 12 of them have been on Validia since basically the 2003, 2004 timeframe. And then just recently we rolled out the uh, 10 new models. Um, The Acquires Multiple, based on your book, is actually one of them. So congratulations. Thank you. Um, uh, And in that set, there's uh, this twin momentum strategy that's a very, that has a very good performance. and that's basically looking at, it's looking at fundamental momentum and then it's looking at price momentum. So it's pr- trying to couple those two things. So, so companies that are exhibiting like, you know, an upward trending improvement in various fundamentals and then that are also exhibiting price strength. Um, <clears throat> that it, and then selecting the top 10 or 20 stocks based on that. That's been a very good performer. And uh, yeah. So it's it's those types of strategies. Well, it's been a momentum growth market, I think, for the last decade. And it just mm-hmm. when when you were when you were when you were talking about the uh, the bank, the European bank that had released the the MSCI value showing it was down over that decade. I was thinking about the um, I think uh, Rob Arnott uh, of uh, Rafi of the research affiliates, Meb Faber tweeted out uh, some of his slides from a recent presentation, which showed. Mm-hmm. The dominance of growth over value uh, over the I think it's a twenty year chart, and I tweeted it out just because I was so blown away by how dominant growth had been over value, and it showed that we're sort of at the levels that we were at in the late nineteen nineties of this extended decade, mm-hmm. and now leading to I think it's two or three standard deviations, which you know I, I having having lived through it, it wasn't fun, but I'm excited for the future because I think that what has ha- what has happened in the past, assuming that we that the world is going to look more like it did in the past in the future. And I think it tends to do that. We're going to see mm-hmm. some mean reversion. Hopefully we'll see some return to value. Yeah. That was a really, I, I saw, I actually saw that presentation and I downloaded those slides. There was a lot of good stuff in there. And I mean, to your point, that's what, you know, if you looked at, at least with research affiliates, like the expected returns of asset classes or even categories of stocks, I think it was, I mean, the, the, the value was where the excess, returns are likely to come from um given well, the crappy performance of that <laughs> well we're at the we're at that part in the cycle where everybody's making fun of value investors because value investors have had such a bad you know 10 years of performance how do you justify charging a higher fee for active management when you know you can get basis points for right the s&p 500 an etf an etf uh, that tracks that index and it, it outperforms and it generates these Risk-adjusted measures, these sharpened Sortino ratios that you know any kind of uh, hedge fund would be happy to have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, w- what value strategies do you track? You track Buffett, you track Graham, you track Greenblatt. So, 
Yeah, let's go down the list. So Buffett, Graham, uh, a strategy based on Ken Fisher, which is, uses the price to sales and has a strong value tilt. Um, O'Shaughnessy's cornerstone value strategy, which he published in What Works on Wall Street. Um, that's the blend? That's not the blend. That's just the large cap uh, value strategy. The, the blend is the well, it depends on there, there's multiple. I mean, what he did and what works on Wall Street is he did. It was basically in the first edition. It was like a small cap growth momentum model and then the, the large cap value. And then he combined the two for the blended sort of combined optimal portfolio. Um, since that first edition, he's kind of come out with different uh, iterations of what looks to work best over time. Um, but we we track the um, uh, the cornerstone growth and value models on Validia, and one of the new models is also using his value composite model right. from his book, which looks at five different value metrics and then looks to identify the top stocks according to that. So that's on Validia. Uh, the John Neff uh, strategy strategy based on David Dremen. Um, which is a deep value, large cap, like deep value contrarian well, let's, strategy. Let's, let's dive into Dremens for a moment. How does okay. how is how is his uh, how is this characterized? His starts out by um, well, I mean, it's a deep it's a deep value strategy. And interestingly enough, one of the one of the things that is crazy with the Dremen strategy is from '03 to like '07, the thing was by far absolutely our best performer, like like significantly and you know that it tends to pick up a lot of like international stocks um and it always has historically there's always been a lot of financials also in there so as you can imagine since basically the financial crisis the thing has been in the tank um but the strategy starts out by looking at um it looks at the largest 1500 stocks in the market <coughs> oops Sorry, <laughs> I just the largest 1500 stocks in the market. And then um, it looks at four different valuation metrics. It looks at uh, I think it's uh, price, price, P.E., price to cash flow, price to dividend and another one. And it wants at least uh, the stock to at least be in two of the four value it wants the, the stock to pass at least two of the four value criteria. And then it looks at a series of like the current ratio and like improvement in underlying financials. Um, that's essentially what the strategy is. Um, is, in that, a is that from his contrarian investing? Yes. Yep. Yeah, it's actually, um, I print it, it's contrarian investment strategies is the book. So it's, um, it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's closely tied to the value factor because it's it, it is a combination of value ratio so when the value factor is doing very well which it did from the early 2000s through mm -hmm. to 2007 it did very well and then where the value factor not not necessarily priced a book just any kind of ratio has struggled over the last maybe two thousand mid 2010 to to date it's been a very right. rough period yep so um, you have this choice of all of these different strategies that you can use and then you have this money management firm Mm -hmm. And that's uh, managed accounts and a f and an ETF. Is there anything else in there? Um, we threw our hat in the ring in the robo advisory sort of business too. And, and robo. So and robo. When, do, when when folks come to the to the firm, do they say for a managed account, I want the Buffett strategy, or do they say I want you to give me the best ideas from all of the strategies for this time of the cycle? We have a set of strategies that are based on a combina combinations of the models that we run. Um, but we have some clients that either we do custom development for, um, or if somebody feel, feels very strongly like, you know, I am a Benjamin Graham disciple and I want like deep, deep value exposure. Um, we can do that. It's just, you know, everything we've seen and we've talked about it, you know, over the last like 10 minutes, it's like any uh, growth or value, any concentrated portfolio of 10 or 20, 30 securities, you know, if it's especially if it's just one type of strategy, you can be like all over the place. So we actually try to be very careful with our investors and say, listen, if you know, yeah, you think you, 
we understand you're like, you know, a believer in value investing and the, the like the Benjamin Graham, you know, intelligent investor, def- defensive investor model. But you got to have the thickest skin to be able to um, stick with that strategy. And we do have some clients that have done it, um, you know, and and so when that turn in value comes, I if they're disciplined, they're going to get rewarded, I think, um, hopefully so. But, you know, we generally try to do blends is kind of the, the answer. There's a, I mean, it, I'm, I'm always talking my book a little bit on this, but I am a believer in value because I, because it appeals to me intellectually and probably it's emotional as well. I don't know, but, um, I've, I think it's a good idea if you believe in a strategy and it does ultimately end up working to, to stick into it, to stick in. And I have this, I, I met this guy, uh, recently. He's a, he's an investor in, uh, he was one of Monish Pabrai's early investors mm. and he has a record that's better than Monish Pabrai. Because every time Monish is down, he gives him more money. Oh, really? So he do, he do, kind of dollar cost averages him, but when when the strategy is underperforming, and Monish has got a Monish has got a phenomenal record. So this yeah, guy, what is his, what is, do you know? What's his long term? Is it like I don't know in, in the twenties or something in it, terms of his annualized return? I, I'm not entirely, but it, it, like over over, I'm, I don't know. But the, the okay. sort of numbers that I I thought I had saw was it was it was thousands of percent. Ten, maybe tens of thousands of percent over sort of a couple of decades, something like that. Yeah, the reason I, I you guys, it was a chart that you put in your weekly the content roundup. like recap. Um, actually, last weekend, it's a chart I encourage like everyone that's watching this, which hopefully some people watch it, right? Um, to to look at, but it's it's the chart of um, it has returns on the y-axis and the number of years on the x-axis and it shows all these like great superstar investors and you know where they would be so if you have like buffett buffett has 65 years at like basically 22 percent annualized return so he's way out to the to the right and you know pretty high up in terms of the return and then you have even guys like greenblatt and like um like Lynch, you know, I mean, like Lynch was like 29%, which was phenomenal, right? But it was like 13 years. So, I mean, he's like, in terms of the time frame, um, it's, you know, far less, obviously, than Buffett. So, I just, I find that chart, like, really fascinating. And it just does go to show, like, how, you know, and we know this, it's obvious, but, I mean, how crazy, like, Buffett's long-term performance is. Now, with that being said, if you take the last 20 years for Buffett, you know, it hasn't been anywhere close to that. But I mean, that's not, that's just, that, there's a lot of factors that play into that. I just, I find that chart um, very interesting. And it circulates around, like once every couple of years, I see that pop back up. Um, right, I remember it well. That's why I had to put on an update because I think that everybody's seen it. And there's another, there's another version of it that has guys who aren't necessarily value investors on it. And there's some absolutely yeah. phenomenal returns on that as well. I would be curious to see like Jim, I don't think Jim Simons from Renaissance was on there. I think one of the uh, one of the uh, ways that folks generate very good returns is by having a strategy that just starts right at the beginning of a good run for their strategy. Mm-hmm. So if you're a value guy and you get started in the early 2000s, sure. you get a f- the, the first seven or eight years, you get some phenomenal performance. And then if you just even market perform for another decade, you get a, a pretty good looking right. track record. It's the guys who invest through multiple cycles and outperform through multiple cycles as their asset base is getting bigger and bigger. So it basically, we're, we're really only talking about a very small handful of guys here. It's probably Buffett and Soros and maybe Druckenmiller and a few other guys like that who've got some genuine skill. But the, the really hard thing is that if you underperform for a few years and you're a manager uh, and you don't sort of have enough equity in the manager to, to control it, you can be, you can be um, fired from the... Uh, um, fired from your role and you know that there's there goes your track record so 13 years is actually a pretty long track record for actually so that's true that's a good point maybe maybe you're you're right it takes a long time to get in the seat you know you might not get into the seat until you're in your 40s you run it for 13 years you're you're in your late 50s like that's and it's time to hand it off to some other young guy in his 40s but there's so many things that you said that i i really agree with it's like you know you don't know if you're you know if you were a value even with like validium when we launched our models initially in 03 tracking these portfolios that sort of set the stage for the asset management business and you know and they're the models are sound they're based on things that have worked over long periods of time but we launched it in 03 so we had we were coming right out of that uh 
bear market and, you know, value went on a great run. And so our models were tearing it up. And, you know, we, we definitely, we, we benefited from that. And the people that were investing with us benefited from that. Um, but you know, then you had this cyclicality and the underperformance of value. So now it's like, you know, we're not benefiting from it. So, and you know, that's why it's very important to, uh, you know, have a believe and have conviction in the strategy that you're invested in. From my experience, and I've worked with hundreds of investors at this point, and it's we're human. It's just it's how we're wired. It's there's a lot of things that play into it. But as soon as you lose conviction or doubt starts to, to creep into your mind about is this strategy the one that I believe in, pretty much it's over. I mean, I've almost never been able to convince if I if a if a client or an investor starts to doubt and not believe in what we're doing, um, then, you know, they're probably not going to be a client for the long run. And, you know, and that that's going to happen. That's part of running money and, and, you know, being an active manager is you hope to get the right people on the bus. You won't all the time. Um, you know, and you try to educate along the way and some people will listen some people won't. It's just, you know that. If you, if you, and I I absolutely do, which is why all of the books that I have written have focused on the behavioral elements of it, because I do think it is uh, crucial to outperforming. It's often that it's trite, and it's sort of a cliche to say it, but it is darkest before the dawn. The, the time when your strategy is really about to start working is right at the time you want to fold your hand. And often that's right. because the other people with less conviction are folding their hands. And so all of a sudden, the capital sort of drains away from the strategy, and that sets it up for a really good return. One thing that sort of, you know, that I, I wonder is you have obviously with ETFs and quantitative strategies and, um, you know, like I just I think like BlackRock is I mean, Vanguard has like their value ETF now. And so this like capitulation in the value investing like arena, I don't know if just given the proliferation of like these quant value strategies, if, you know, you're going to get as much as you would have maybe when those didn't exist. Um, it's just a question I have in my mind. Like, like we talk about everyone like folding and clearly if, if growth continues to outperform, like more and more people I think will gravitate and assets will follow the performance. And so at some point you'd like to think there's this like tipping point where that changes and the regime changes. But I almost feel like you need some, and maybe this will happen. Maybe there'll be consolidation. Some of these value strategies will, won't be around in five years because value will continue to underperform and firms will shut down those strategies and go to what. So I mean, maybe that's how it'll play out. I don't know. Yeah, there's, uh, I've, there's lots of, there's lots of data to suggest that, uh, that ratio value is, is, uh, potentially going to struggle for that reason that there's a lot of money in it. But the only, uh, thing that I would say is that when you look at any list of the flows to ETFs, for example, so there was mm-hmm. a that I think it was might have even been Ben Johnson from Morningstar, or, or it could have been Eric Balchunas from Bloomberg who tweeted this out. But they showed the top ten the flows to the top ten ETFs that have launched in 2019, and the top ETF was an ESG, um, that's Environment Social Governance focused ETF, and it had raised 850 million dollars. Wow. Since the start of 2019, phenomenal performance. But then if you go down that list, number 10 on that list was a focus value ETF, which is hmm. somebody's doing a little play on QVAL, I think, which has done fairly well. Okay. Yeah. Um, it had $30 million in it. Huh. So that was, the t- that was number 10. <laughs> right. So yeah. I don't know that there's that much money chasing it. And I don't talk Probably to anybody not. who's, who's, right. who's just <laughs> champing at the bit to get into a value fund because it's so yeah. hot right now. You know, you would, that, it just goes to come show. Back. I mean, just goes to show if you can raise thirty million in an ETF, you'll be at top ten. <laughs> you know? Since the start of two thousand and nineteen, right. so well, it's, it's a yeah. short period of time, right? Yeah, that's 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 good performance. But I just think it just it demonstrates to me that you know, there's it's not. I think that there are a lot of folks who see that value has had that very extended period of underperformance. It's underperforming mm. by so much now that if you're a contrarian, it is a good time to start allocating to. To value strategies, but I think that there's a lot of people who, who know that intellectually, but really uh, on an emotional level, they're like maybe you know, <laughs> Saint Augustine, give me, 
give me chastity and give me whatever it is, whatever else, but, you know, not yet. I just want to yeah. see a little upturn in value before I start allocating to it. Well, and there are so many different ways that you can define and express value, right? I mean, the, you have your acquirers multiple. I mean, all the strategies we've talked about, they're different. I mean, you know, they're all getting the value. They're all getting their value tilt or their value um, bias through a different set of criteria. So, and you know, if you're running a focused, a very focused value strategy, um, you know, I think that it's, uh, yeah, I just think that, you know, you can still, you can, you can get really, really strong returns when the, when the reversion happens. Well, even if you're, even if you're, uh, a value investor who's more like Buffett, who's looking at the individual businesses and not mm-hmm. caring so much about the ratios. And Buffett's explicitly mm-hmm. saying that, yeah, low P and low price to book, you know, that can be associated with a value buy, but it's not necessarily associated with a value right. buy. Even those guys who do that sort of stuff, look at the growth, try to find the the steady growth rate. They are still tied to the value factor in some way. They're not, they're not spending this last decade massively outperforming by mm-hmm. by mere virtue of the fact that they're doing a DCF, right? I mean that's one of the things that I always think is uh, uh, most telling that a lot of guys who are my vintage, so who've been in the markets for about the last ten years, running a value strategies for the last ten years, nobody's particularly well known. Maybe Alan Meckham at Arlington, but there's nobody else in, there. and even Alan's not particularly well known. There's there, yeah. but there are lots of guys who are who are out there who are running strategies, but it's just because everybody has struggled to keep up with the market, even mm-hmm. doing that additional work and listed private equity. We're going to do a whole lot of work, make sure that each, we're going to polish each stone before we put it up on the shelf. But it doesn't mm-hmm. help any more than the guys like me who are just like shoveling all of the, the rubble into the, and hoping right. that there's, it doesn't some, matter. there's a gem it doesn't in matter. there. Yeah, for sure. Yep. So in your ETF, um, how's the ETF constructed? Do you look at how, what's the process for s- selecting a strategy or stocks or how does that work? So, yeah, I guess I can talk mostly about the index because we're, we're the passive uh, fund. Um, and the way our index is constructed is we select 10 different investment strategies and allow each strategy to select the top 10 stocks. So our, e, our index is 100 securities, um, 10 different models selecting the 10 top scoring um, issues. And, you know, there's a review process at the end of every year where we look at our model lineup and we look at what we know um, about the performance and correlation of the various models. And select the models that we feel like are best positioned when sort of combined Mm -hmm. together as these, these 10 different strategies. Um, and the way, you know, right now the index is certainly a, I mean, we're basically like, it's, it's like a, it is effectively like a small cap value fund is what, if you were to put us in a morning star style and size box, um, and we, um, our index is actually rebalanced monthly. So, you know, one of the things obviously with managed accounts or with an ETF, like the turnover, you know, you don't want to be turning 50% of the portfolio over every month, which some of these models, if you just let them run, you need a way to manage that turnover. So the way we do it is we layer in an additional uh, component and it's, we call it our intelligent tax management system. Um, Hopefully it's intelligent, but it, it, uh, it, well, it basically, we're trading about 10% of the, the index, about 10% of the index is changing on a monthly basis. And the way it works is we're holding, and this same, it's the same process for the index and also the managed accounts. We're holding our winning positions until at least 12 months and our losing positions that don't meet the models that don't fall in like the model that have fallen in score are the ones that are, are removed um, from, from the model or from the index. So what that translates into are strategies that still follow this rules based systematic set of strategies and they still hold true to following and selecting the stocks that pass the gurus, but we're harvesting losing positions and we're holding on to winning positions. So it, it creates a much lower turnover strategy 
and it becomes much more tax efficient. Obviously, with a passive vehicle, passive ETF, you know, the custom create and redeem process um, allows you to um, forego capital gains. But, you know, with managed accounts, obviously, with taxable money, it's important. So trying to figure out a way to manage that turnover without giving up too much performance is what that tax system is effectively trying to do. Do you Did find I this your question? Yeah, okay. do, do you yeah. find this overlap between the strategies do they they try to buy the same stocks sometimes? We don't allow it, but there will be. We just go down to the next and, and baked into the system is if we if we're already holding the stock, it'll go down to the next highest scoring security to, to kind of fill the portfolio. So it's possible that one strategy could be selling and one strategy could be buying, in which case you just don't move the position. Let me think about that one strategy if well so the very deep value guys so you could buy i mean i i see this happening all the time like I, yeah. i'll particularly in the early in like 2008 9 i'd buy all of this uh junk and mm. uh, and i was buying it because it was at that time i was basically only doing net nets and so i'd buy these things that were for people who don't know net net is uh you're looking at basically the most liquid portion of the balance sheet, net current asset value. It's just the cash, inventories, and receivables. And then you're discounting all of the liabilities, deducting the liabilities from that. And then you're trying to find stuff that's trading at a discount to that. So this stuff is really, really cheap. Right. So I'd, And the reason it's cheap is because I've got terrible businesses or the businesses look terrible at that time. They look like they're going out of business often. So I would buy these things. And it's it's just it's just the way that deep value works that nobody likes to, the management team doesn't want to go out of business. So they start doing whatever they're supposed to be doing or competitors leave and the business improves a little bit. And when that business improves, all of a sudden it starts popping up on other value investor screens because these earnings are now you've got one or two or three years of good earnings in a row. So it's possible that a value, a very deep value investor can buy something and flip it to somebody who's a more franchise or earnings power right. style investor. So well, do you see that? Well, I think, I th yes. I mean, the it certainly can happen. I think it does happen. I think like, and what you're really getting at, at least in our world, is like the intricacy of running these models, which is, you know, and on the surface, these things seem like very easy. You have a screen, you have a set of criteria, you find the stocks, but you know, how do you, again, how do you manage turnover? How do you manage the situations that you're talking about where you're selling a stock and then buying it right back? How do you break ties? How do you, do you have a stop loss procedure in place? You know, what happens if the fundamentals aren't, are fraudulent or there's some type of fraud? What is your, you know, what, what sort of rules do you have in place to actually take a quantitative strategy and implement it in an actual money management portfolio? And like what I'm, I guess, really trying to say is that there's a lot more that goes into that um, and that needs to be thought about. And, you know, then you get into how is like our investment process different than your investment process and how is your investment process different than, you know, the other uh, value, qu you know, quantitative mm -hmm. guy down the street that's running, you know, stress. So, and all of that, we like to think ours makes sense. It doesn't always mean it's the best or it's, 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 it's perfect, but you know, it is the reality of running models. And, you know, we've kind of learned a lot over the years of, about what needs to go into that, what needs to go into actually implementing like a, a quantitative strategy in the real world. Do you, do you do any additional fraud, financial distress type screens on top of the 100 or do you rely on the individual strategy to sort of do that? We have something similar to – one of my partners, Jack, wrote a good article. We have like a quality composite score and there's four different things that goes into it. Um, we were just talking about it too. If do you have show notes that we can post or whatever, yeah. like links? I can post yeah. it. Well, afterward, and I'll put we'll post the article because um, it's really good. It's it's how we actually implement our quality score and what we're doing there. And I think you might do this with acquires multiple. We don't use short interest. We use a couple of other factors, but um, we're just removing the bottom five percent of those quality because we just want to make sure that you know there's we're not missing something huge. Um, like for example, like I know one of the things is, uh, current year earnings versus analyst, f uh, 12 month earnings. And if like, like let's, let's take energy when like the price of crude fell from like whatever, a hundred to like 30, you know, analysts were quickly cutting their earnings estimates, probably not even fast enough, but 
you know, you, you would have got that. I mean, slant caught really hard with value traps because, you know, the earnings weren't, the prices were moving so quickly and the earnings weren't reflective of the decline in the commodity. Right. So what our quality thing is trying to do is, and it wouldn't have protected us that well, honestly, in that, cause we held, held a lot of energy like in 20, late 2015, early 2016. It's just a lot of our value strategies were bringing us there, but I think it would, it, you know, would have saved some of the pain in that. Um, we, the quality measure that we're implementing, this quality component is a little bit of a newer uh, integration into our models, I'd say, like in the last year or so. Um, <clears throat> and we're just really cutting off the bottom, the very worst sco- scores on the quality. And, you know, my, my partner Jack would say, you know, what it's trying to do is avoid value traps. There's no way you can ever avoid all value traps. Well, it's I always say you don't, you don't know it's a value trap until after you've bought it and you've held it for two years and it's not up. Right. No, that's true. You're like, the only way you know is after the fact. It's very hard. So, so in quantitative value, we, we talked about some of the uh, I don't, I don't, hygiene of the, uh, the universe that you're going to draw from. So we excluded uh, you know, things that have got financial distress risk. Right. Which is sort of so bankruptcies are bankruptcy is something that it's an event that happens or it doesn't happen, but financial distress risk is sort of a is a continuum and as they get riskier and riskier, they get more likely to be in bankruptcy, so you want to exclude them. You want to exclude earnings manipulation f- mm-hmm. because it it gives you a misleading picture about what the company's actually doing, and it's also a gateway drug into fraud, and right. fraud is the thing that we're trying to avoid, so we have fraud statistical fraud measures as well. but the funny thing I always find is that when I look at the universe so that does that does great things for the entire universe of stocks. So if you look at whatever universe is, say the Russell 1000, if you exclude the 5% that score worst on those, that Mm -hmm. universe does then do better. Mm -hmm. You can improve the performance of the Russell 1000 doing that. But it doesn't actually do much for the portfolios because the Venn diagram of the stocks that are ultimately selected and the stocks that are going to be excluded anyway, they don't overlap. Oh, do you know okay. what I mean? Because yeah. it's already yeah. looking for, you know, it wants a, a cash rich right. balance sheet. It wants cash flow earnings. It wants So stock those being kind reborn. of factors are, yeah, you're not really get, excluding the companies that would be in the portfolio. You wouldn't buy them anyway. Right, right. And the sort of stuff that, the sort of stuff that gets picked up by those things is the stuff that you would expect. And most of the time you can eyeball them. They tend to be companies that are quite expensive anyway because they're, mm-hmm. they have to create that illusion. You know, they have to... That, in order because they want the only way they're going to survive is raising capital they got to sell shares they got to sell right. some debt and that's where the fraud comes in and that's why i think it's a nice thing that, that really work best all together because they often you find when it scores badly on one it scores badly on all three mm-hmm. you know because mm-hmm. they all go hand in hand yeah so um we've we've seen this uh really difficult time for value do you, you you're sort of you i i get the feeling that you're you're not uh you're not necessarily a believer that value can turn around it, it, you don't think you can do it again oh you don't think that oh no i i, I mean no I, I i strongly believe in i mean to your point earlier i think value investing there's you know the underpinnings of what makes value stocks work I believe very strongly in that. I just don't believe anyone can time the turn in value um, or the turn in any of these factors. And but mean reversion is a very powerful thing in the market. So looking out over the next you know ten years, I do think value stands a very good chance of you know imp- certainly improving its relative performance. Um, but you also have to always question your beliefs to some extent and just try to be, you know, that's one thing I've, I've kind of tried to do more of. And my, my partner, Jack is, he does a really good job at it. I don't, you know, I tend to like on Twitter and the articles I read and stuff, I read the things that like, I kind of agree with. And, you know, when I hear like, you know, like fundamental investing is dead or somebody like that's bashing Buffett for like his performance over the last 15 years, like, you know, like I kind of I, I don't agree with that stuff. And you know what I mean? So so but I also want to I want to be open minded to that, that, you know, in the markets, things change and things can go on a lot longer than we think. And they have been. 
for a couple of years now. <laughs> I think value investors have been doing a lot of introspection, particularly, I think like the last decade has been rough, but the last five years in particular, I thought five years into the underperformance was enough. And that yes, no, lot- we were, I think we were writing about it like five years ago, like turn in value, like we were you <laughs> Here know, it saying, I, I think we might've been, I mean, one of the earlier ones, you know, and, and we, we were wrong and uh, it kind of humbled us, I think in that sense. Um, I, I've, I've been saying, I've been saying, it's five years for so long that it's longer than five years now. I think it's I've been that saying been for six saying or seven years. years. I've actually exactly. got to say it's exactly. seven years. It's it's so long. Exactly. And that and that that I I well, read I always think of that article that um uh, Malcolm Gladwell wrote about Nassim Taleb and Nassim Taleb used to say to his trader, Have you introspected today? Introspect, introspect. Uh, yeah. I think right. you know, every value investor out there is just there's so much introspection going on. Why aren't these strategies working? Like, if you if you're a value investor who's kept up with the market over the last decade, you're a genius. Oh, you for just sure. Undis- undiscovered. Right. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And I think you know that having lived through it, I I remember all of the you know there's a there's a suggestion that uh, the problem with the value strategy at the moment is it's so focused in in bad sectors. So it's focused in energy. Mm. It's focused in financials. And having lived through it, like I, I can point at each stage along the way, you know, all of these disasters like Chinese reverse takeovers, that was, uh, you know, they all came on, they looked pretty cheap, they all floated right. down into the value stuff if you bought them, you got carted out, and then there was the for-profit colleges. Oh, we, yeah, I know, yeah. If like what was them, the Corinthian College? Corinthian and- Co- Coco, oh. I remember it well. Yeah, these things were like, you know, trading at like a PE of like four or something. You and you know? backed out and- the cash, they were free. Yeah, right. And then uh, energy more recently. Yeah, there's just every at every at every stage along the line, you've just walked into like a value trap industry. Well, and I sort of feel like we've had these little bumps. Like, what was it? Was it 2017 that value had pretty decent performance? 2016, because 2015, 2016. it sold off really hard into right. the end of the year, and then it bounced at the and, start. Of 2016. You know, we've gotten these like little bursts of like strong performance out of value, and you think it's like okay, now it's now we're set up for the run, right? And and then it like, you know, the next month it's like, okay, then it's like, I mean, look at this year. I mean, it's like, right. it's kind of, it started off decent. January was good. And then, you know, now look, it's Apple and the micro, it's the big, it's the big mega cap tech names that are, you know, kind of driving a lot of the market performance. Um, there's, there's an enormous amount of timing luck in all of these strategies. So I, I think about 2012 in particular. I mean, that was one, I remember it fairly vividly, but at the beginning of 2012, value got, hosed and then midway through 2012 it did start working then in 2013 uh the market had a very good year the market was like up 30 percent with very little volatility before i I forget which is the last that chris cole who's a who who i've had on the show and who's a buddy of mine he he tracked these um and he we, we used to talk about this a little bit he'd show me these periods of time in the market where the market just goes up at a 45 degree angle without any volatility so you get these incredible risk adjusted and 2013 was one of those years where that market just was straight up with no wobble through the year and then i think it was one of the best on record in a risk adjusted term Mm -hmm. in risk in risk adjusted terms and then um and then one of the more recent years beat it again i don't know which year maybe it was 2015 or 2016 beat it it was just a better year again Mm. Well, you had right. Most stocks were participating, I think. And, you know, when you have your average stock doing well, you know, it just by statistic, the the odds, you know, kind of these con- more concentrated value strategies, I think, have a chance to really um, perform well. I, you know, one of the things I don't know what you feel about this, but it, I almost feel like it might be a bear market might be what we need to change the psyche of investors for this style to come back into favor. You know, if you go back to the 2000 to 2002 bear market, that was obviously like there was crazy valuations, right? And like a lot of those companies, you know, um, and that's when you saw value. I don't think we're at, it's not like the similar type of story from that point in the sense that you don't have as much overvaluation, let's say. Um, But, you know, maybe the bear market will get some of the, flow that has gone into like all these large mega caps and kind of more growthy like names and you know you'll see a reversion in value i don't know i just think that like it's kind of interesting to think about that way like the turn might not come until you have 
like pain at the market level, like a bear market type environment, maybe. But, but with that being said, I mean, look, we've had, you know, even though we don't talk about it and the Ritholtz guys like kind of talked about this recently, I mean, there has been like three mild bear markets, right? In this, since, since the end of, uh, you know, beginning of 09, um, really, I mean, 20, what was it? 2011, right. 15. And then the end of last year. And if you look at something like the Russell 2000 or like any of these equally weighted, like, you know, I mean, stuff was down more than, more than 20%. And right. value still in turn. <laughs> the, the, the question is, is that, is that enough of a market clearing? Because what, you know, one of the things that I always say is you have to be, you have to understand where your strategy is going to work well. So where value, and I think this is one of, a, a bit of a myth about value that people think it does better in a drawdown. I'm not entirely persuaded that that's the case. I think that that's only if it's, only if it's, if the strategy itself is undervalued. But one of the things that it does do very well is it, it comes out of the it recovers before the bottom in the, the right. rest of the market and it should bounce fairly hard out of the bottom whereas momentum has it works better at the end of the cycle mm-hmm. it, it'll always be running very strongly but then in the in the drawdown the last time that we had a big drawdown 2007 2009 momentum was down 90 percent was it really 90 percent and wow. then it takes uh, it takes twelve months for the signal to even start working. For that twelve months, you can't use right. the signal. Right. And so then it then it, it sort of spot. So momentum, it's that's a really tough one because you've got to be you've got to be in it up to the end of the cycle. Somehow you've got to pull your chestnuts out of the fire just as it sort of tips over, and then you've got to stay out for a while. Yeah, it's like that. Cra- I think it's called like crash risk with momentum. It's like once it's done, it's done. It's just like completely collapses at so. that stage you, you you switch into value and you uh you, you ride that for the next decade or the next uh, the next month as it happens the factor timing maybe next time i come on we'll do the factor timing uh discussion do, do you have any well what, what's your what's your intuition without having test do you have you tested it factor timing yeah yeah we've looked at it i think like generally we still think it's extremely difficult to do successfully and uh, you know, I, I don't know. I don't think we've, we sort of tend to think like tilting towards a factor is better than like a light switch going on and off, you know? So if you, let's just take, let's just take the validity models. For example, if we, if we combine 10 of them and, you know, let's say like, uh, if you, if you want to have a blend of value and growth, let's just say 50, 50, well, the longer value underperforms, the more you want to try to more tilt towards value. So you want to start sprinkling, go stronger towards value. Um, but with that being said, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that, like I mentioned earlier, like it's like, it doesn't, that that's sort of making a call that value is going to turn and it might not in the short run. So, right. um, I mean, that's I the, know pro- there's kind of, the, the problem that I have stuff. seen when I look at the, when I look at the, if you look at growth versus value, for example, on both on when values are performing, they they get this sort of um, exp not exponential is probably the wrong word, but it's this cascading. So when value is underperforming, it's it just the 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 bulk of the underperformance happens right at the very end, or the most rapid portion of the underperformance happens right at the very end. And same when it's the other way, the most the biggest chunk of the outperformance happens right at the very end. So if you're, it's very hard to time it because if you're as you're slowly switching into it, you're getting this worse and worse performance. For one thing, it makes you think that you're doing the wrong thing. And particularly right. in a period where it's extended like this, yeah. the more value exposure you have, the more risk-adjusted, risk-hedged or um, risk-managed exposure you have, the worse you're doing relative to the market. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think we're coming right up to the very end of, uh, of our time. It's flown by. What, if folks want to get in contact with you, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, so um, you can follow me on Twitter at JJ Carboneau. Um, that's my Twitter handle. Um, obviously, you can come to Validia and sort of look at the research and the models that we're running there. Um, and then, you know, from there, if anybody ever wanted to just have a call with us and, and learn more about what we're doing, I mean, we're always available um pretty responsive like you probably were working like you know seven days a week uh most of the time um so, i don't regard it as work i love it yeah exactly well hey i mean that that you know what that, that's a great way to s- sort of really end it though is that you know i feel really lucky to do what i've done 
and, you know, have this opportunity at Validia. I mean, we, we sit here and work hard day in and day out. I have one foot, you know, in this internet sort of company and the other foot in like an asset management company. And, and, you know, I get to meet cool guys like you and do podcasts like this video casts. What are we calling this actually? A vlog? The acquire multi- I just v- vlog acquirers podcast. Yeah. <laughs> nice. There, there you go. There, there is a, there is a, uh, there is a video component to it. So you can, for, for people who don't know, there is a, if you're listening to this on the, on the, on the audio version, you can go to YouTube and you can see Justin and I talking uh, and, and see all of the hilarious facial expressions we're making each other. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think, uh, yeah, that's and that, that's, a, that's a great way to, you know, I appreciate you having me on. This has been really fun. Hopefully we can do it again soon. Um, and uh, let's hope for the turn in value. Yeah, for sure. Justin Carvin of Validia, thank you very much. Thanks, Toby. <laughs>